afternoon, loggies. Our next event is a panel of women in defense logistics, moderated by Miss Maggie Sleeper, Principal for Supply Chain Solutions at LMI. A graduate of the United States Air Force Academy, Colonel Retired Sleeper has over 30 years of logistics executive leadership across several federal government agencies. Please welcome Ms. Sleeper and her panelists to the stage. Can you guys hear us okay? Awesome, thanks. Um, good afternoon. Uh, it is truly an honor to be up here on stage with these amazing leaders, um, and I'm actually very humbled. Um, uh, before we get started, uh, I just wanted to welcome you to the Women in Defense Logistics sponsored panel. And for those of you uh, who aren't familiar, uh, Women in Defense Logistics um, is different from the NDIA affiliate Women in Defense. Um, it's an, an organization that's actually part of the Logistics Officer Association, and it was started by and for CGOs, FGOs, and civilian equivalents in the defense logistics community. Uh, it provides an opportunity for early career mentoring um, and professional development opportunities such as moderating on stage or speaking engagements or topics that are just important for the professional development, uh, leadership, and military operations of, of women in defense logistics. Uh, it also plays an important part in the promoting of the principles of the Women, Peace, and Security Act passed in 2017, um, which have, of course advances the role of women in international peace and security. So now that I've got that commercial out of the way, uh, <laughs> I'm going to introduce our esteemed uh, panel members today. Uh, most of these probably don't, all of them don't need an introduction, but I'm going to anyway. So Lieutenant General Linda Hurry, who is the, of course, Vice Commander, <laughs> Air Force Material Command. Major General Vanessa Dornhofer, uh, Mobilization Assistant to Lieutenant General Miller, half A4. Uh, Miss Kim Brown. Good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Oh, who is the yeah. half A4L, Deputy Director of Logistics in the Pentagon, and Chief Master Sergeant Mary Beth Fair, who we're so excited to have, the Command Chief, Air Force Sustainment Center. So. <laughs> All right. Can you hear me okay? Game on. Okay, game on. All right. <laughs> Uh, for the next uh, hour, this panel is going to explore the topic of our role in integrated deterrence, um, a phrase that might have some slightly different um, definitions to many of you in the crowd, depending on where you sit in your role. Um, but on that note, I'd like to start the panel off with a level setting question. So Major General Dornhofer, ma'am, if you could please give us uh, a definition of integrated deterrence to, to kind of set the stage and maybe share a little bit about how the SECAF is currently tackling that concept of integrated deterrence and maybe your thoughts on where the department should focus first. All right, well, Maggie, thanks for the question. Everybody hear me okay? Great. Um, so first, I, I do want to thank Maggie um, and the Weidel team and LOA for having this panel today. So um, it is a real honor um, and a bit surreal to be with this panel today. I mean, <laughs> Maggie and I were uh, classmates at SOS, so uh, we go way back. And so again, a surreal moment. I'll also just add before I get into the topic of integrated deterrence that I'm also having a surreal moment because I went to University of Missouri right down the road, and I can tell you that uh, no, no one in my ROTC class saw me up on stage today, and <laughs> excuse me, let alone myself. Let alone, um, let alone myself. So, so let's talk uh, integrated deterrence. And um, instead of giving you um, the book definition of integrated deterrence, everything we're talking about here at LOA is in some way connected to integrated deterrence. I could talk, you know, what came out in the NDS um, in 2022. If you really want the clear book definition of integrated deterrence, I know every login here has read it. And I hope you have at this point. Um, and it really spells out kind of what we're doing as a Department of Air Force and how we're going forward. I think what, what I'll share on integrated deterrence, it really gets down to war fighting effectiveness. And you've heard it in a lot of, you know, whether it was the 5i panel yesterday, whether it was uh, General Minahan talking about interoperability, what we do with our allies and partners. 
It is doing integrated, integrated war fighting effectiveness across all spectrums of conflict, across um, using all elements of power. And I will share a little bit about what the SECAF is doing right now to kind of get after it, and then a favorite quote that I heard from one of our very own airmen uh, just recently. So in terms of, um, in terms of what the SACAF is doing. About a year ago, the secretary stood up what they call the Integrating, Integrated Deterrence Working Group. And it's really kind of the blocking and tackling of getting after the issues that, you know, interoperability, we talk a lot about it. We talk a lot about the work that we're doing with our allies and partners, but it is hard. And we need, you know, some senior level folks to, and SAF IA leads the, this working group to help block and tackle some of the challenges. The two areas that this group is really t tackling right now, and you think it's easy, but you know, information sharing is critical, right, to our work with allies and partners, and that is hard. And so that's part of it. And then this concept that you're gonna hear a lot more about over time, it's called integrated by design. And that's working with our allies and partners at the front end of buying capability and making sure we're baking in what it means to have not just sustainment on the front end, but actually working with um, our allies and partners on developing capability and capacity. So, so that is um, kind of that integrated deterrence side. I will share one last quote before I turn it over back to Maggie. Um, one of our airmen, who, just about two weeks ago, who now happens to be our chairman. I love saying our airman. We've got an airman as a chairman. Um, he said, you know, when it comes down to it, integrated deterrence is easy. I mean, it's hard to do, but the definition of integrated deterrence is we've got to be good at what we do, so good at what we do that our adversaries don't want to mess with us, period. So turn it back over to you, Maggie. Thanks. That's awesome. Very good. That's pretty cool. Okay, I'm going to turn uh, the next question to Chief Fair. And because I know you and Lieutenant General Hawkins just got back from a whirlwind tour to uh, a trip to Indo-PACOM. So, uh, uh, and I know General Hawkins talked earlier as well, but could you give us a, gl a glimpse of some of the efforts being explored that will help provide or uh, kind of a, a help us arrive w to integrated deterrence within AFSC? Yes, ma'am. If I may, before I answer the question, I just want to share that this is my first LOA and so I really feel like I'm made on the main stage. <laughs> I didn't necessarily grow up in this functional community, medic by trade. Man, I'm telling you, uh, I've always admired just the uh, interconnectivity that you all have in this community. So I just feel really blessed to be sitting here. And not only that, because I'm sitting with these legendary leaders of this community. So I feel like I've really ticked off a bucket list in my career. So thank you so much. Um, with that question, yes, ma'am. You heard Ger uh, Lieutenant General Hawkins this morning. He did spoke about um, uh, GENUS, right? So again, it stands for Global Enterprise Network for Universal Sustainment. And essentially, our, our goal is really to establish, if not further nurture the relationships that we have with our allies and partners in the Pacific theater. And so with the goal in mind that perhaps we can explore uh, the potential increase in capacity for sustainment, um, and not only the capacity, but the capability, right? Because what we're trying to do is, is so that our organization can then uh, have the further agility and adaptability to maneuver um, quickly from com competition to crisis to conflict if required, right? And that could easily mean um, increasing or leveraging on the existing maintenance, repair, overhaul uh, uh, capacity, but also supply chain capabilities, but um, perhaps even embed personnel simply just to uh, train, assist, advise. Um, and so our first, uh, Launch for the for the survey was to Australia, New Zealand, and the Philippines. But before we went there, we really made sure that our our PACAF and Indo-PACOM headquarters le senior leaders are aware of our effort, our lines of efforts, so that they know that we're clearly aligned, not just with their priorities, but really um, at the same time with uh, the allies and partners as far as their objectives. But not only that, it's really we're, we're clearly aligned with operational imperative number seven, right, with uh, our AFMC strategic plan lines of effort with NDIS and even the recently published regional sustainment framework. And 
which is the blueprint that calls for sustainment prevailing in a contested environment. And e even with strengthening um, joint partnerships so that by way of optimizing supply chain or uh, again, leveraging MRO caves or even adding uh, MRO caves, to me, it cannot be denied that we've succinctly aligned ourselves and our lines of efforts um, with those uh, goals and objectives. And so Australia, well, Honestly, all three countries were, were promising and very supportive with our goals and objectives, with Australia having met um, the Deputy Chief of Mission and then the Royal Australian uh, Air Force. They just really tr so, truly saw the value in what we're trying to do. Um, New Zealand, it's a smaller country, uh, definitely smaller footprint when it comes to their defense force. So same thing, very supportive, but definitely cautious because of their limited resources. Um, and then the Philippines, and if it's not clear, I am, I was, I was born and raised in the Philippines, I am Filipino, um, <laughs> um, so I, I, I immigrated in 1992, and I never, uh, I didn't go back till 2008, um, and that was for an unfortunate situation, my grandma passed away, and then finally coming back this year, right, so knowing that, it really, uh, I, I think I was just more in a mind space of, okay, you go in there for official capacity, but it was, it was good, it was nostalgic to me. Not until we landed there and um, the Philippine Air Force senior leaders really were very um, encouraging in their support and just really interested in what we're trying to do um, to help them with. But what really resonated to me is that they did see me as an ally, not just because I'm wearing this uniform, but because I share their heritage and culture and that um, I, for one, surely can understand their, their crave for uh, independence and, and sovereignty, which is really what they're trying to make sure that they maintain as even with their collaboration with us. And so uh, I say all of this to say that with integrated deterrence, I really think that leveraging those strengths of our allies and partners, right, while uh, bridging the gaps, existing gaps that we have here so that then we can orchestrate to be this agile, resilient defense ecosystem, um, I think, um, so that then we can uh, maneuver and shift shape when it comes to uh, distributive environment or highly contested environment, whatever you call it. I really think that any sinister force will have to think twice, if not three times, to even mess with us. That's all I have. Awesome. <laughs> drop the mic. No, no. Drop. <laughs> medic drop. Low is the best. So you started with, I'm a medic, and ended with, everyone understands you're a lotistician now. Yeah. So. <laughs> Honorary lotistician. Fantastic. <laughs> all right, thank you so much. Um, all right, Miss Brown. Oh, boy. It's nice to see you. You as well. Uh, we heard uh, General King talk yes, uh, yesterday about the importance of allies and partners, obviously, on stage um, here and, and in this road uh, to great power competition, especially. Um, can you talk to some of the deliberate efforts that you're seeing from headquarters A4 uh, or A4L in uh, participating, that they're participating in to improve interoperability required uh, for great power conflict, if necessary? Sure, thank you, Maggie. And first, let me just say how how humbled I am to be sitting on this stage. I, I can, it resonates with what the chief said. Um, you young people in the audience, you know how your parents always told you, be careful of the company you keep. So when you you keep company, you get roped into things. And so, um, so I feel honored and and like I said, humbled to be a part of this esteemed panel here today. And as I looked out across the audiences over the week and I listened to all the leadership, I thought, wow, what, what an awesome group of professionals. And I was telling the young lieutenants that we had lunch with just, just before this that 
I am so encouraged when I see these young lieutenants and, and these young leaders and seeing the potential and knowing that as we hand the baton, somebody mentioned that earlier this week, um, that, that we have such great uh, young people and people to, to hand that baton off to. So it's, it's just really encouraging to come to these and get reblued a bit. And so specific to A4L in the question, I'll get back to that. Um, <laughs> So we are doing an awful lot in this space, and I could, I could talk to you, I could bore you to tears talking to you about policy changes and different things that we're, that we're going after. Um, over the last several years under General Miller's leadership, um, now General King was General Hurry previously, there has been a laser focus from an a, half A4 perspective on building relationships. And I've heard it said that you should drill the well before you need the water, right? So you don't want to get in the middle of a conflict and, and not know who to reach out to. And one of the things that really struck me when I went to A4L was the importance that A4 was putting on those relationships with those other senior leaders. And I mean, I, I went to Israel actually a couple of months before things popped off in October. And that, that very weekend, that Saturday morning, literally got a group ch chat saying, hey, can you guys help us with this munitions situation? And uh, General Hartle, if he was here, he's not here, but he teased me and called me a, a battle captain for the weekend because I was, I was all about it, you know. So, um, but building those relationships and then General Hurry received a call from one of their generals saying, hey, can you help us with this? But really going after those relationships and, and knowing who to call in these situations if we think about the F-35 and we look at across Europe, um, I think the, the saying, if I remember it correctly, it's 500 to 50, right? Um, and 50 of those are going to be ours. That interoperability and that maintenance and, and having that capability today, we use depots in Italy to, to get after some of our maintenance needs. But really having that, that interoperability across and one of the other areas that we focused on and memo have been signed to allow technicians, if it's from another country, from our partners and our allies, to, to really look at how we maintain those weapon systems and if there's somebody that's certified doing that reciprocal agreement across. Uh, been a big part, you've heard it mentioned, I think we've talked all week long about strategic partners and allies. You've heard us talk about the 5i partners and in A4L we co-lead a team with um, A4P and Mr. Beatty's group, Shannon Boykin, to um, look at decision advantage and what data do we need to share. We know that our, our log cops and our dashboards and all knowing where everything is from a joint perspective is going to be critical. So co-leading those, having those conversations, hammering that out, how are you going to share it? We know we've got Blade, but I think it was one of the, um, uh, the Australian leaders that said, but how do we share that when we get into a, a contingency? So those are just a few of the areas that we have been focused on. Um, I, I could go on and on, but in the interest of time, I'll hand it back to our facilitator over here. Um, back to you, Maggie. Thank you, Ms. Brown. Certainly. So, General Hurry, I know that you have all kinds of additional thoughts on this <laughs> subject, <laughs> and you have all kinds of experiences. Uh, in your new role, uh, are there any additional experiences? I know you, you're steeped with what Ms. Brown talked about, but I know that there are other other things as well. Yeah. So. If I'll, I'm gonna, I am going to piggyback on what Kim said in terms of what we've been doing with the Five Eyes partners. And, you know, if you look around the room, the fact that we have an Australian LOA chapter and a UK LOA chapter, we've got folks attending each other's courses. They're in ALROC. We're doing exchange offs. That's just huge. The ability to communicate, to understand each other's systems is just, you can't even measure the benefit that, that is coming of all of that. But we always talk about Australia, we always talk about UK. We've got to open up the aperture with Japan. And we've really started to do that. You know, I had the honor of, of taking a team over to see our counterpart last year um, at the Jazz Def. And it was amazing. You know, as we were giving our presentations about the types of things that we are challenged with, it was like we were giving each other's presentation. It was the same thing when I was talking to Sean Harris and Dave Houghton. It, it's the exact same briefing, just different nation. And we have 
similar solution sets. Now the question is, where can we combine those solution sets? And I will tell you, relationships matter. So when, when Kim said, when things kicked off in October, no kidding, General Conforti and General Sensipur of the Israeli Air Force called me and said, I really need your help in supply chain. And, and they gave us a list of various things that they really needed. But the fact that they took the time to pick up, to, to literally call me to see if I can break down the bar barriers, break down the bureaucracy to get a teammate some help that they absolutely need, those relationships truly made a difference. Um, so we have to continue to build upon them, and there's a lot of different things we can do that. We talk a lot about bureaucracy. Kim talked about the rules. You know, we struggled for years to try to hand over tech data to Australia and the UK. Like, come on, we've got to get out of our own way. You know, the Five Eyes is a thing. It's been around for a while. We can, we can change our policies and procedures so that we can help ourselves. The good news is we have figured out a way to get over that, and that has been successful. Airworthiness authority. Yes, we've got access in place right now, but the airworthiness authority in AFMC actually signed a memo such that if any of our allies, their maintainers perform maintenance on our aircraft, we don't have to be standing them over their shoulder. They sign off. It is airworthiness. It, we've, we're good to go on that. And that took entirely too long to get there. So breaking down that bureaucracy is unbelievably critical. Now there's probably a list of a hundred other things and we want you to come up and tell us what those are so we can continue to break down those barriers. Um, interoperability, we talked a lot about that in every single one of the conversations. You know, one of the things we're really trying to do in Air Force Material Command right now, um, as I'm learning my new role, I'm a whole, you know, whopping two months in there, um, but the whole thing with great power competition and stand up with the integrated uh, development office is if there's technology and there's innovations and AFRLs going after certain things, we all talk in this room about agility and a lighter, leaner, meaner footprint. Well, what if whoever's developing that next radar or the next pod or the next fill in the blank can support multiple weapon systems? And we need to think in terms of our Air Force, that's great, but what about our joint service? brothers and sisters? What about our allies and partners? And maybe that next radar, maybe that next piece of comm equipment, or the next version of Link 16, fill in the blank, whatever it is, what if it could support all of us? That helps everyone, it helps all of our allies and partners, because Lord knows, logistics is a team sport. You don't do it by yourself, you never will, never gonna. How do we get over the end? So that, in, that capabilities office is also really going after horizontal integration. You know, right now and in the past, we've had each of our program offices focusing on being the best dang program office we can possibly be for that particular weapon system. But if we really look at what we're trying to do, it's horizontal integration across all of AFMC, across all the platforms, across the joint force. And so we're creating an integrated development office to try to help that and try to help level set and to come up with priorities, a one-to-end priority, so that we're all going after the right things at the right time and we're synchronized. And so that COALA, that basically builds on some other uh, changes that our Air Force is going through um, from a higher level to no kidding give us an Air Force level one-to-end list such that we're developing, we're modernizing, and we're also sustaining and those are not um, out of sync. So a lot of things going on in this space right now, <laughs> but I honestly say it all comes down to relationships and being able to actually communicate to one another. Mm -hmm. Thanks, ma'am. I appreciate sure. it. Anything else? Oh, that was okay, all right. <laughs> saw your <laughs> eyebrows raising. <laughs> all right, so uh, after this first round, I'd like to pivot. Uh, the next round of questions to focus a little bit more on uh, folks that are in the audience. Um, I'm not going to take your questions yet, um, uh, but we want you to be able to see where you fit into uh, what we call integrated deterrence and this road to great power uh, competition, uh, however we want to say that. Uh, but Chief, I'm going to start with you, if you don't mind. Um, you have, a, as you said, you have a role as a combat medic. Woohoo, that's awesome. And you've spent uh, several, several years uh, serving in a command chief role. Um, so you know the airmen, you love airmen. Uh, would you mind sharing your thoughts on that warrior ethos or spirit 
Yes, ma'am. She said several, several years. Um, at least it's just two, three. <laughs> I was counting. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh, okay. So yes, medic uh, by trade. So growing up in that in that community, uh, saving a life is in the vernacular, right? Of my daily operations. Whether it's truly driving an ambulance, yes, I could reach the pedal. There's there's <laughs> tools for that. Um, <laughs> Google it. Um, or or in the intensive care unit, or in the ER. But even in the in between tasks of uh, doing administrative um, follow-ups or phone calls to patients, uh, I could really resonate and link my purpose and calling to what I'm doing. And so I tell you, um, 2004 was my first deployment. It was in uh, Balad, Iraq, and it was in, during the heights of Fallujah. So you can imagine just the busyness of it, so much so that uh, as my first deployment, daily activities were maybe three to four, five average of mortar attacks on the daily, right? And so being able to experience that, uh, I, it really, I remember the moment when the first one hit, we were still just coming out of the C-17, and so it was really a surreal moment. And you can imagine, you know, young 20-year-old having to really internalize that at any given moment in time in that period, I could lose my life. And what really, I think, grounded me from that point is the fact that every day I had, I had a mission to do, I had a purpose to do, and that's knowing that uh, the doors to the emergency room would open and we would have 70, 75 casualties. Um, and these are your soldiers, Marines, airmen, right, um, that would come through. And I think it, it again, it grounded me to maybe drown a little bit of what potentially could be uh, the, the fear that's rising up within, right? And so, so I say that to say, when it comes to warrior ethos, now the, the, the airmen, the, the really uniformed personnel that we have, uh, the, the last really emerging uh, conflict that we would have seen was in 2001 for 9-11, and then sure, we had some uh, multi-theater conflicts that you're seeing now, but truly for our, our folks, they have not seen a war in their lifetime, and they're not gonna see the kind of war that we've seen either. And so for leaders in this room, I would just offer that not only do we embody what truly warrior ethos mean. And that's not something you can buy from a store, right? Or slap on and tattoo it on your arm or your legs and then be good. Um, it is a daily um, mindset. Mm -hmm. And the way that we can offer our folks is to have conversations now, even yesterday. Uh, lay down the facts, educate them. The more that you uh, lay down flat, the true reality, the harsh reality of what could come, uh, whether it's, you know, as leaders in your formations, offering intel briefs, right, or facilitating that um, so that they truly understand um, the reality of the situation, training to where they train uh, and play like they're gonna do it in, in the real, right? Uh, that, in, and get those muscle memory going because, at, again, as a medic, that's really what I was able to count on. It's just my training kicked in, mm -hmm. even though there are sounds of sirens going off and people screaming and, uh, and, and people in pain. It's just I, I was able to zero it in on that to say, here's my task, get her done, right? And so I think as leaders, that's, that's a lot of the things that we can offer, but it's the sense of brave, braveness, courage, right? And, and that we, we internalize, but then the sense of confidence that we can offer our airmen, our, our, our soldiers, our Marines, our, our, our guardians, that's the kind of stuff that leaders can do at this point, is to continue to build that confidence, and you can build that by setting the stage for them so that when uh, true conflict happens, a lot of those, um, the muscle memory just kicks in, and it's, it's game time. Thanks, Chief. Yeah. All right, General Hurry, I'm gonna come back to you uh, because I think almost everyone in this room also knows your passion for airmen, just a little bit. 
Uh, so what piece of advice would you tell our youngest airmen as they prepare and train for great power conflict? Um, so yes, I, um, I am driven by airmen in and out. It's through and through. That's very much my passion. Um, and I am unbelievably impressed with the new folks that are joining our team. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some of the lieutenants that, that we've walked through the, the halls and had a chance to talk, and just their eyes are wide open, and they're so driven and passionate about just making our Air Force better, and it is so much fun to watch. Quite frankly, I think that's why all of us in the front row come to these things, mm -hmm. just, to, um, just to get re-blued, to get re-energized, and just to get their ideas and then get help, let, let us help them and get them out of the... Um, promote their ideas and promote their ingenuity and then get the heck out of their way. And so it is so, so, so much fun. Um, so I do have a couple of recommendations for everyone. And I know this is a, a women in defense panel, but honestly, um, the recommendations we're given is really for anyone on our team, regardless. Um, so a couple of recommendation, recommendations. As we start preparing for great power competition, number one, know what your mission is. Know what the commander's intent is, because you're going to have to go out there and execute with a team of folks, and more than likely at some point, because of cyber, because of attacks, because of various reasons, it's going to be in a disconnected environment. So if you know the mission, you know the commander's intent, you're going to have to go out there and execute and know what needs to be done, and then, oh, by the way, you're going to need to know how to think on your feet. And so you're like, okay, great, how do I do that? So, one, I would recommend build trust amongst your team and build high-performing teams. There's a couple of different ways to do that. I would suggest getting out there and just getting to know your teammates because you're going to go down range, you're going to go perform some task, and you got to know where your strengths are, where your weaknesses are, who works well together, who handles certain things, and that diversity of your team and knowing where your strengths and weaknesses are as a leader is so unbelievably important because you want to be able to say, hey, Maggie, I need you to go do this. Fire and forget, she's going to go off and run. Hey, Vanessa, could you please handle X? And they go off and do that. So you got to know your team in order to do that and build that trust and camaraderie amongst your team. Um, build relationships. I think we've all foot stomped that 100 times over, but that's why everybody's here. Yes, it's here for professional development, but it's all about the relationships. And anyone, you know, our communities are so broad, you can't possibly be the expert anywhere. I mean, you can't know everything about all, everything in our community. And so knowing that, you know, person A has got the expert in this part of the community, or person Y has got the expert in this other part, and we know how to connect the dots. If you don't know that and you don't know where your strengths are, it's really hard to accomplish things. Um, so that is another one. The other one is the ability to communicate. Sometimes it's body language, sometimes it's actual communication. And so where I'm going with this is kind of piggybacking on a couple things the chief said. So, you know, our whole goal as we start getting ready for, as we continue getting ready for great power competitions, we've got to help set the theaters. We've got to know our allies, we've got to know our partners. And a lot of that is done in a political realm. Do we have access to the base? Are we allowed to do things from a political aspect? Well, I will tell you, airmen on the ground are amazing and they can get a lot of things done without the politi political piece. So imagine you're an airman on the ground in the Philippines. And from a bigger picture, they don't want to preposition a lot of different things. But airmen talk to airmen. And if you can communicate and work together, work side by side, you may be amazed at what you can get done together. I share that with you because we've got programs like the LEAP program, the Language Enabled Airmen Program. Don't be fearful of that program. If you're a supervisor out there and your airman wants to, to jump into that and go for it, let them, because that's only going to make us stronger in the long run, because it's the ability to speak with allies and partners and communicate and understand their culture and understand how they do things. So when we had the opportunity to go to Japan, yes, we talked a lot about logistics, but a lot of it was a cultural aspect. We had to understand where their priorities and how they handed things. In, in, when we were stationed in Korea, understanding how the Koreans handled things in certain manner, 
If you can communicate on the same level, it makes a world, a world of difference. And so those are kind of like probably big four things that I would recommend to anyone out there on the team. But don't be fearful of a different culture, a different language, a different nation, the grand scheme of things. You know, logistics is the same around the globe, no matter where you go. So building those bridges is unbelievably important. Thanks, ma'am. I appreciate that. All right, General Dornhofer, I haven't forgotten about you. <laughs> um, all right, so I'm going to brag a little bit because um, I think it's important for this group to understand that you have a civilian and a reserve background. That's pretty unique, in the, in, especially in the international space, uh, and, it, and certainly unique to a, a lot of the logisticians in the room. So you've, you were in a Talsi in your younger years. Um, the old CRG is what that right. was. <laughs> um, Way back. You've done some work with NATO, um, specifically with NATO, and then most recently, uh, you were the U.S. submission uh, as the nominee for a senior role with the U.N. So, uh, so pretty impressive, uh, the impressive. whole U.S. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Maggie, stop. Okay. Um, so given that background and experience, um, can you share maybe a, a specific experience or a specific time in your career where you learned the most about the value of those relationships with our partners and allies? Thanks. And uh, full disclosure here, Maggie did give me a heads up. She's like, think about when you were young and, and come up with a good story. So, well, first, um, I want to ask um, for my, my total force on the, on the reserve side, how many reservists do I have in the room right now? Give me a shout out. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on. Come on up. <laughs> All right. How about guard? All right. Woo. Okay, great. Um, no. So, First of all, I do want to start by saying that um, I, I have had a bit of a unicorn uh, career, and, uh, but I am truly grateful to the Air Force Reserve for kind of catching me uh, coming off active duty when I was at a place in my life. This is, you know, um, kind of post, this was actually right before 9-11, but I kind of felt like I f found my calling and kind of humanitarian assistance and wanting to do that on the civilian side, but I also was trying to build a family and I just was figuring out how to make this balance happen. And, um, and uh, I, the Air Force Reserve caught me and I have had um, just nothing short of it, just uh, amazing. As my father used to say, you know, it's a great day to be in the Army. I start my day with it's a great day to be in the Air Force. So I've been really blessed that way. But to get after your, your question and an experience that I had, it's one that I've used quite a bit in, in different forums, but it kind of gets to the heart of what we're talking about. And I was young, I was young, this is the, um, the 90s, coming out of the Cold War. I found myself in Romania. This was at a time where it looks very similar, and, and, and there's a lot of similarities to where we are now with trying to have these large-scale exercises and to build coalition and to, to work <coughs> at training our allies and partners. Um, and I found myself in Romania, in Bucharest, Romania, for a couple week TDY to start training. Um, do, we were doing site surveys. This is my time in the Talsi. And I had an interpreter with me. And um, he was with us the whole time, and he was doing a remarkable job at kind of, you know, helping us build those relationships in, in between all of the language barriers. Um, and we were having, you know, we, this was a large, you know, we were building up to a very large scale exercise. Well, the night before I left, we had a nice dinner, and we were really, you know, thanking all of our support staff and really thanking our interpreters for all the work that they had done for us. And on the side, as we were getting ready to leave, he um, he came to me and he said, he said, "Do you know what makes America such a great nation?" And of course, I was young at the time. I could, you know, I was like, hey, "We're pretty cool. I think we're pretty cool." Um, he said, "You are a nation of." problem solvers, inventors, and innovators. And I just was really taken aback by him saying this to me. And he said, but more importantly, he said, uh, do you know why? And I, um, I sat back and, and he said, listen, he said, never forget that you have the freedom to think and the freedom to dream. And that's what makes you good at what you do. And that, let me tell you, as I think the foundation to getting after this integrated deterrence, because we share those values and those democratic principles with our allies and partners. And when I, if you see passion here, it's because I have seen this play out over and over. And I will tell you just a really brief story and I'll wrap up. Um, at lunch today, we had stars and bars. 
And um, I know she's going to hate it. I asked for permission to bring her up. But um, Captain Weiser was sitting at my table. And right now, she's in LNO, living in Thailand with our Thai Air Force. And if, if that's not integrated deterrence, folks, I, I really don't know what is. Her experience and the work she's doing and the challenges she's trying to solve on the ground there is just remarkable. So I just, I just want to make sure that we don't lose sight that what brings us all together is something larger than all of us. And, and it really goes back to those words um, that I have carried with me uh, foundationally throughout my career. So thanks for the, and, and she did tee me up. So I got to think about that a little bit, but <laughs> it was really foundational to uh, what I have just loved every single minute That's of my career. It's a great career. story. Thanks. thanks. Thanks for sharing. Okay, Ms. Brown, uh, we, heard, we heard General Hurry uh, give her advice on what she would tell the youngest airman in the room. Uh, what, what is some advice that you'd give the young logisticians to include the civilian uh, uh, logisticians in the audience today as they consider a career path uh, within, uh, within the Air Force? We could talk about it for hours, but I do, General Hawkins, I understand completely how you felt going after General Minahan, um, oh, going oh, after no. that story. That was <laughs> awesome, General Dornhofer. Um, so being the only civilian uh, here on this stage, I will tell you just a little bit about my story. Um, I've been married to military all my life, and so um, I, I tell people I was a late bloomer because I got married very young, like 18, 19 years old, and then traveled, right? And every time we would get stationed somewhere else, I would start my career over again, right? And it wasn't, it wasn't the same then as it is today where you have a lot of online school and courses. Every time I would, I would take, say, 20 classes at a particular base, and then we would move to another base, and I would have to start over. Well, we don't accept those credits. They're not the same, you know, and so we definitely have advantages with that today, but I, I, I started working for the government. I worked for, actually, for the Department of Defense Dependent Schools at Fort Bragg, of all places. Oh, I guess it's Fort Liberty now. My apologies, but... Um, as, as a payroll clerk, and I will tell you that, um, and I started, I think I was about 20 years old, and the one thing that, if, if I can leave you uh, with nothing else today, especially for the civilians in the crowd, it's, it's kind of like when you go to the doctor and they tell you something about your health, and then you don't hear anything from them again, right? And you're like, you know, I probably should follow up on that. <laughs> it's, it's kind of the same from a, a civil service or a career perspective, taking that into your hands because you control your destiny when it comes to your career. Uh, yes, you'll have leaders that will advocate and look out for you, but at the end of the day, it's about knowing what opportunities are out there. And when you're at Pope Air Force Base or you're at Keflavik uh, Naval Air Station in Iceland, you don't know a thing about CDE and Air Command and Staff or Air War College or these classes that are, that are available to you. So you really do. I was fortunate when I got into the logistics career field as an item manager at Robbins, I was fortunate to um, have some leadership that kind of said, hey, you know, we see some potential. Not that they didn't in the earlier years when I was going from base to base and I'd get my foot in the door, I'd do secretarial, whatever the case may be. And, and they would say, you know, Kim, you need to go to school. You got you to finish that degree. But when I got into the item management and logistics career field, I will say a uh, big shout out to, to A4 and logistics because our workforce development is probably second to none on the civilian side. But really... Um, and if you're a supervisor of GS7s, GS9s, 11s, Palace Acquires, whatever, whatever your role may be, make sure that you educate yourself first and then let those civilians that are looking to you for guidance understand what opportunities are there, whether it's career broadening positions or, or um, KCP, key critical positions. There are so many opportunities. Um, I think sometimes when we think of the Department of Defense, we focus a lot on the military, and we know that military transfer from place to place, but as civilians, it, it is truly unlimited the the opportunities that you have and I and I will tell you being 
at the senior level, my favorite thing in the world is having people come over to the Pentagon, shadow me. I've, I've had an opportunity to really work with some incredible, um, Al actually one is here from the 448th, Mr. Gray had introduced me to Allie and, and she came up with Amber and, and they shadowed me for the day because they wanted to see what it was like in the Pentagon. But really um, find out what's out there, find out what opportunities are there. It does not matter what what grade level you are today, it does not, you can make a difference. You can be a part of this strategic deterrence. You can be, you can one day be on this stage educating the younger folks and, and really helping them to get where they want to go to. So um, I think if General Hurry talked about building relationships and, and all of that is, is, is key, but making sure that you understand what opportunities are out there. The workforce development folks are here. I don't know if any of them are in the room. Shout out. Anybody here? They're getting ready for the panel that we're on after this, but um, just just get get educated on what opportunities are out there, and never underestimate your capability because um, you can do great things. You're the continuity as our military move around. You're the continuity. Um, General Moore and I were talking about that at lunch with the lieutenants that our civilian population is very much that continuity as as leadership and and the military transition now, especially in AFMC. It's very civilian focused, but um, I think that's probably that's where fantastic. I'll Fantastic thought. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yes. Thank, Thank you for you. that. Sure. Actually, I'm going to piggyback on that and give a shout out to Kim. So, um, you know, you can see her passion about mm -hmm. talking about the civilian workforce and the capabilities. And so, I've got three kiddos. Uh, my middle son. Um, is now a GS7 in the Palace Acquire program because of Kim. Um, I think he had a little bit to do with it. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, yeah. So, I mean, he went through the interview process. He did all that. But, uh, you know, he, he kind of all along knew that he wanted to serve. I mean, goodness gracious, he's followed me around. He moved, heck, 13 times before he got to college. And so he knew what service was about, and he, he knew he didn't want to move that much. He knew he wanted to be part of something bigger than himself. And even though I talked to him till I was blue in the face, what does mom know? Kim gets a hold of him, <laughs> and all of a sudden, he's applying for the Palace Acquire program, he's applying for this. Lo and behold, he did well after, I think, three or four hours of massive coaching on the two of us. Um, but yeah, so I now have a baby loggy amongst us, and I'm thrilled, but honestly, we owe that to Kim and her passion for, for bringing up those um, that are just starting out. So thank you, Kim. Thank you, ma'am. It does take a village. I mean, this is, it does. I have a middle son that's graduating in May, so <laughs> should I? I? I told you send me his <laughs> resume. <laughs> <Yeah. I'm> <laughs> happy to hook him up. <laughs> we need good young people. And, and it, it really is very much about knowing, knowing where to go, because a lot of kids, unless you have parents that are military or affiliated mm -hmm. with the Department of Defense or, or the government, a lot of kids don't even know right. that there's jobs and availability out there right. and opportunities out there. Oh, thank you. So. That's awesome. Yeah. Okay, I, we have about 13 minutes left and I think we have uh, some time for questions from the audience. Is there anyone that was keeping them? Oh, awesome. Thank you. Good afternoon. We talk about interoperability with our allies and partners and sister services, but we have a hard time with interoperability across our own aircraft in the United States Air Force. Are we doing anything to open that aperture? So that's a great big one. <laughs> um, I, I almost want to. You want to start? start? I'll okay. start, and then I'll. Otherwise, I'll, I was going to throw it down to General Hammerston. Then, <laughs> actually, yeah, I'm looking say. at my notes over here. <laughs> Who doesn't have a voice, so she could be up here with us? <laughs> no. I think she's lacking a voice. I think she is. Oh, oh. yay! Thank okay. you. I don't have much of a voice. <laughs> great. Um, I think the question was interoperability within. Um, so it's a great question. Someone came up to me at, at our last commander's conference, ACC commander's conference, said, hey, are we getting after being able to crossload or you know, have weapons loaders on an F-16, load an F-15? And, and as much as we've been talking about interoperability with our allies and partners, I had to look at that person and go, we have not made a lot of progress with that. So we're, we're trying to get after that exact question. How do we 
um, how do we load even use loaders on an F-16 to load an F-15? Let's start there before we start talking about different countries. So we are moving out on that, um, as well as a lot of what you've heard in some of the panels about uh, rapid sortie generation and getting smarter about you know, how do we use our ammo troops, for example. Any ammo troops in here? Okay, good. Uh, to you know, do the inspection of the of the of the weapons before you know. Why do we have the uh, weapons troops? You know, lose 15 minutes reinspecting the weapons once they come from the bomb dump, as an example. So just getting smarter about how we do those combat turns and such. But we are getting at the uh, interoperability within the Air Force. So yes, thanks. Thank you, General. Dornhopper, any no. any other comments? No, that's, no? That's, that's, Jen. Perfect. No, that's Jen Hammerstead. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> she was supposed to be up here, but she's under the weather. So <laughs> we are missing you up here, ma'am. <laughs> okay. Uh, next question. Next question. Yeah. New capabilities require new training, CFETPs, exercises, and repetitions. How do we ensure the total force is prepared, especially as we need to be ready to fight through the highly contested environment? Uh, General Dornhofer, you want to start sure, that? Sure, sure, absolutely. Um, so, in terms of, so I caught, I think the, the backside of that was just I heard total force and I heard, um, you know, how do we get after kind of the, the, the growing, what it seems like, this growing trajectory of training mm -hmm. requirements. Um, and I think you've heard it in a lot. I mean, just, you know, I came in late last night, but I've heard it a lot this morning, you know, this concept that we're, we're really going to start having much larger scale exercises. And it is almost reminiscent of the time when I came in where we were doing these big drops and, and you know, you were launching, a, launching you know, numerous aircraft at, at one time, working very closely with the Army, Army counterparts. Um, you're going to see a lot more of that. Um, for On the reserve component, both the Guard and the Reserve and the part-time force, I mean, it does present some challenges that we're going to have to work through. And the one word that I would throw out is uh, predictability for, now, you know, when the balloon goes up, the Reserve and Guard are going to be out the door just like the active duty. Um, but in that training cycle, in, in having, you know, looking out and anticipating and, and having predictability, not just for the individual and their families, but it's really for our employers as well, and making sure that they can build that into the schedule when they lose that workforce to these large-scale exercises. Because you're talking about these units that, you know, you know have, have, you know, pretty tight ties into their community and having predictability on where to fill in those, you know, especially when we start doing these large-scale exercises, I think will be tremendously important. I think the only other thing I'll add is, um, and this is one, you know, I challenge everybody in here, when you are building out and planning an exercise, ask those questions right off the bat. How am I integrating my guard, you know, my, you know, it doesn't take, you can, you can draw the circle, you can put a pin in a map, draw the circle and find out who your guard and reserve uh, counterparts are. You can find out who in the joint area. And I know that I think what, what we're offered right now is an awesome opportunity to get creative about kind of how we exercise. And I know like units like Westover, you know, just did kind of that, um, do I get any Westover folks out there? I heard, I uh, right, awesome. Um, you know, where they put, um, they did a lights out exercise. I mean, they took the energy down, but they, they, they coordinated to where they could have a really useful, um, you know, get really hardcore training skills. Um, but they did all the work that it takes on the front end to make that happen. So they made it joint, they made it interagency, you know, and then and take it a step further, make it, you know, make it with our, you know, allies and partners. But I would say all of you are going to be in some, at some point in time in planning an exercise and ask those questions. How are we folding in the folks that, you know, we need at the table for this exercise and then build it again and again so that, you know, reps and sets mm -hmm. are critical. And again, for the total force and the, the part-time side, I certainly think predictability is the key for us. So, that's, so I hope that no, kind that's of got perfect. after it. And then that's I, I would lean on my, I'd that. lean on Chief yeah, as well. I would, Chief, I would yeah. like to add, ma'am, because I love that notion when you said folding in, or, so it's a total force, but I would offer too that because we're truly pushing the envelope on how we prepare for a great comp power competition is to remember that at least for, because it's close to my heart being an AFSC, a majority of our force is civilian. That's right. Our, our, mm -hmm. our civilian um, civil servants, I tell you, they are just as patriotic and many are even far more 
<laughs> than the blue suitors. Um, these are your veterans, your retirees, your long line, you know, family members of a long lineage of military um, uh, retirees. And so we can't, we can't really take for granted the great talents that they can offer, even if it's not necessarily um, going full on, right, with the large scale exercises, but they have brilliance, they have talents, um, they have ingenuity, innovation, um, that they can offer to you as you as we continue to explore this extreme teaming, right? Um, I think that's where we can really push the envelope in a lot of this. So I would just offer, man, never leave anyone behind um, when it comes to this potential that we can explore. Excellent. That's, that's great. All right, we might have time for one more question. Each of you have broken down barriers for women in leadership in such a profound way. What is your advice for young CGOs and NCOs who want to influence and make a difference in the logistics community? Who wants to start? <laughs> <laughs> who wants to start? Uh, honestly, figure out what you would like to do, set your priorities, <laughs> and then go for it. You know. Um, What's your passion? Yeah, find, find your passion. Mm -hmm. For me, my passion's airmen. Everybody asks me, you know, you've been in now for 33, almost 33 years. Why, why do you stay? And I look out in the crowd and right there's why. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, we've got an incredible mission. Uh, literally everything that we do in the Air Force, you know, the logistics portfolio collectively enables it. So we have a sense of purpose. We have an amazing team that have each other's back no matter what. Find your sense of purpose and then go for it. That, that's what I would recommend. Thanks, ma'am. I, I just I just add, I mean, I'm sitting next to General Hurry right now, and it, it is one of those things that um, we can't go at things alone, right? And, mm -hmm. and we, all of us here mm -hmm. have stories of where we've had to reach out for help. And, um, and I would tell you, at lunch today in the Stars and Bars, another conversation was the, you know, and it's, the, it's a question that I receive a lot and we all have, which is how do you, you know, um, how do you do it all? How do you balance things? Mm -hmm. And I, I would tell you that I would not be sitting here in front of you today without leaders that have gone on before and, and been kind of, you know, paved the path <laughs> for um, just, just the day-to-day -day stuff, the, the how did you get your kids to the CDC? <laughs> how did you, you know, you name it. Yes. Um, I would tell you that, um, but it doesn't matter whether you have kids, whether you don't, it just doesn't matter. Just don't go it alone. Um, build that, you know, build that team. And you never know where you're gonna cross paths again, mm -hmm. you know, with somebody you went to SOS with. And, um, but that would, I would say, never go it alone and, and build that, um, you know, build that village that you need, so. Yeah. So on, on Friday, we're gonna have a resilience panel. And that will be a theme, so I will ask you, please don't leave early, because um, a couple of us are actually gonna tell our stories. And to that point, I will give you a preamble. I quite frankly would not, and quite frankly probably shouldn't, have ever been allowed to stay in the Air Force after I got sick 10, 11 years ago. But I am, I'm here, because of the help of the team. And I'll give you more of the story on, on Friday. Um, but you don't do anything by yourself. You don't do anything in life by yourself, um, whether it's kids, it's family, it's aging parents, it's pick a curveball. Life happens, and it happens to every single person in this room. What we wanted to try to convey today is we wanted the youngsters in, in, amongst our team to see that it is possible to navigate life and navigate the military, and that you still can serve. It, maybe it's active duty. Maybe it's as a civilian, as a contractor, maybe at, you name it, every single one of us can serve. And not any one of us bleeds any bluer or less blue than the other. We're all part of a team. Now we are challenged, I will say this. If you look at the number of officers that come into the logistics portfolio, about 33% of our officers are, are women. Only about 24% our um, field grade officers. When you get to the higher ranks, we're in the 13, 14%. If you look in the enlisted ranks, in aircraft maintenance, the number of women that are joining our community um, are sitting at about the seven to 9%, but the number of senior NCOs, at least from an enlisted perspective, 0.5%. So somewhere along the lines, we're losing folks in, 
It's great if we bring them into the guard and the reserve. That's perfect. It's great if we transition into the civilian team. But we, what we want to convey to you through all of us, we've all lived life. We've all balanced curveballs along the way, is that you can do it. But you're right, you can't do anything by yourselves. You know, everybody in this room has probably heard the, hey, logistics is a team sport. Yeah, well, so is life. And when life throws you a curveball or logistics throws you a curveball, the way to get through all of that is through the connective tissue that you build in forums like this, with our friends that we grow along the way. I mean, we're all friends up here. Um, I feel sorry for General Miller because he's had to deal with four of us <laughs> for a whole year. Um, but I mean, lifelong friends. Maggie and I were in the same squadron at the academy. Now, I was, for the record, I was her hellmaster and she survived. <laughs> so, for, um, I wasn't very mean then either. No. But, but bottom line, we all grow up together, we all live life together. You know, our kids grow up, our families grow old. I mean, it's just a fact of life. But you can navigate it. You just can't do it by yourself. Or I don't recommend you try doing it by yourself. And so as we try to bring this to a close, I just want to say on behalf of the entire community, thanks so much for choosing to serve. Because it is a choice. You guys set your priorities. I can't set your priorities. General Miller can't set your priorities. That's something you do. Our job is to support and develop and care for you and develop you and inspire you and then get the heck out of your way and let you take our Air Force to the next level. So thanks for choosing to serve. Thanks for always having our backs. And thanks for helping us be the best Air Force in the world. Cool. Yes. Thank you, ma'am. Perfect. We're only seven seconds over. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We're done. Thank you, ladies. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.